What's up, Ken folks? It's RJ Young. I'm not on a step. No, consider the like and subscribe button because I upload a video every single day. It's always a, yeah, college football related, sports related. We have a good time. Today, I want to talk about Texas and the fallout. And we're going to talk to my buddy, Kalen, in just a second. He is, well, he's the athletic beat writer for the Texas Longhorns. And he has been a busy man, as many of you know, because Tom Herman decided to make some changes, as you know. We're going to get to him in about 10 minutes time. But I want to take this time to just say first, hey, how are you? How you doing? And second, to just kind of get us off and rolling with a little, a little monologue, a little rant. So, I got a take, as I'm, I want to have takes. That's, that's actually the job. So, when we look at Texas, and we look around the country, and we do this thing where we want to compare Texas to the upper echelon of college football, and yet they continue to fall short. Because as my man Bomani points out on a regular basis, who is a Texas fan, <laughs> Texas has won seven outright conference titles in the last 40 years. Texas has been perfectly mediocre since desegregation. Matter of fact, Texas still has the, I don't know if you would call this a good thing or a bad thing, that they're the last national championship team to win with an all-white squad. But I'm bringing all up th that all up to say when has Texas actually been considered year-to-year -year elite, right? Because Mac Brown, yeah, won a national championship in 2005, also took five straight losses to Oklahoma. It's not a thing that normally gets to go on and you continue to keep your job, but when you hire Joe Jamel to do your work, you get to keep your job. Now, who else has taken five straight losses against the only team he cannot take losses against. That'd be Jim Harbaugh against Ohio State. Now, Jim Harbaugh, Mac Brown, both excellent coaches. But at their institutions, you have to win that game. Texas has to beat Oklahoma. Michigan has to beat Ohio State. Except for some, it means more than it does to others. I think Ohio State lives to beat the hell out of Michigan. They can't stand Michigan. They hate everything Michigan stands for. In the same way that I don't like a royalist, in the same way that I'm not really going to get with this holier-than-thou mix of college football, the dude that wears the tie to the football game is asking for a beating. All right? It's also Michigan, which is to say that you have the Detroit Pistons, you have the Detroit Red Wings, you have the Detroit Lions, you have the Detroit Tigers. You have options, as they say. Austin, you got Austin City Limits, you got South by Southwest, San Antonio Spurs are just up that way, you can go to Houston just down that way, you're this close to the beach, there's all sorts of great things to do in the city of Austin, one of the fastest growing cities in all the country, okay? Gave rise to Richard Linklater and their minister of culture, who continues to walk around in that ugly hat. In Oklahoma, as they want to say in Texas, Norman ain't got a whole lot going on. Never mind that Oklahoma City's got the thunder. It's not the point. point that I'm making here is Oklahoma is a lot like Nebraska in that we care about football. We love football. We love football so much that the Oklahoma State Cowboys barstool account tries to poke fun at Oklahoma by claiming wrestling championships, to which OU fans are like, we actually don't care. At Oklahoma, Lon Kruger makes a Final Four in men's basketball. And OU fans are like, that's nice. It's, it's nice not to be embarrassed. That, it's nice. But Lincoln Riley makes the college football playoff two consecutive times. He's looking for a third. And no, Oklahoma's not going, cool, we won 10 wins and we got more 10-win seasons than anybody else. It's not going, cool, we style on Oklahoma State every single year. It's not going, cool, we even make the college football playoff. It's, I refuse to allow you to lose to Texas on a regular basis. It's just not going to be a thing that we're okay with. For whatever reason, they seem to be okay with this at Texas. Even as the alumni base is gargantuan. Even as they have more money than anybody else in all of college football. 7-5. and five. They have to play 14 games to win 10. That is not a good winning percentage. Okay? They've had... 10 straight years of four losses or more, which makes them way more like Texas A&M than like Oklahoma, which is why many of us want to see that rivalry 
rekindled because I honestly miss seeing it on Thanksgiving. I like seeing these two programs hate each other and talk noise about each other in a way that only they can. I look at a place like USC, which has similar tradition to Texas, and I look at what they expect Clay Helton to do. And the idea that Clay Helton has not been fired for going 8-4 and four also underscores how it doesn't matter in USC as much as it matters even at Houston, to which they looked at a Texas grad. They looked at a man that was hired as an offensive coordinator for Nick Saban. And they said, we will fire you for going 8-5. and five. And so he goes 8-5, and five, getting skull dragged by Army, getting 70 dropped on you by Army, and they fire Major Applewhite. They fire one of the best products to ever come out of the state of Texas, let alone the Texas Longhorns. And yet, Texas is going to endure Tom Herman going 7-5. and five. Forget the staff changes. That's going to have to happen. You can't stand pat with this. It's not going to happen. Not the way that you lost and not whom you lost to. The same Texas Christian team that beat Texas is the one that lost to West Virginia. It ain't going to be all right. Okay? It's not going to be okay. I don't know what you can expect from this team next year if Tom Herman does not make some changes to the offensive philosophy, let alone who the coordinator is. Because I kind of think that Tim Beck was a lame duck at offensive coordinator anyway because Tom Herman would never come out and say who's calling the plays. He's always talking about it's kind of a community thing. You're not a communal leader, Tom. You're very much I'm in charge here. And you're the guy walking around with a play card talking into a microphone. I know who's calling the plays. I understand you don't want to say who's calling the plays, but I know who's calling the plays. And as bad as Todd Orlando's defense was, he also had like eight new dudes out there because they were all hurt. Maybe it's time to start talking to Yancey McKnight about what's going on in his strength and conditioning room. But before you get there, he's told other dudes, hey, you're going to be off the field this year. You, you're in. You're going to go in. He's made his recruiting coordinator a temporary on-staff employee so that they can go recruiting. Brian Carrington is in the car with Tom Herman. That's where they're at right now. All right? So as we continue to talk about who the offensive coordinator might be, who the defensive coordinator might be, I've been throwing Chris Ash out there for a little bit, maybe Rhett Lashley out at Southern Methodist because they run a similar kind of scheme, but that would also mean that Tom Herman would have to let go of the controls, and I'm not ready to say that he is. All things that are used, that we need to we need to take into account. We need to take into account. 